<clears throat> hey, y'all, today we're going to read A Rose for Emily by William Faulkner. This is uh, one of my favorite stories. We're going to end our, our little Gothic series by reading this. This is by William Faulkner. William Faulkner is from Mississippi. Uh, he was born in New Albany, Mississippi, which is uh, about 35 miles from Oxford, Mississippi. Um, he's, he, he then you know, lived his life in Oxford, Mississippi. He was a student at Ole Miss for a very short while. Um, he, his property is called Rowan Oak. It's on the, it's at the back of Ole Miss's campus. Ole Miss actually owns it now. It's kind of behind the baseball field. If you guys ever go to Oxford, it's on Old Taylor Road. Y'all should go check out Rowan Oak. That's, that's William Faulkner's old property and his old home. It's pretty cool. He lived from 1897 to 1962. In 1949, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And in 1955, he won the Pulitzer Prize for Literature. So he's an accomplished writer. Um, he invented a county called Yachnapatawpha County. It's, it's often mentioned in his writings. So if you ever read anything by Faulkner, specifically, uh, let's say, a book called As I Lay Dying, you'll hear of Yachnapatawpha County. Now, this, this story we're going to read today is called A Rose for Emily. As I said, it's a gothic story. Um, the, 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 the folktale, I don't know how true this is, but the folktale behind this is that he was with some of his friends, and they, you know, talking about, Oh, yeah, you think you're such a writer. I'll tell you who was a good writer, that Edgar Allan Poe guy. Now, now those of you who have been in my class, we've read The Telltale Heart. We've read The Ravens. You guys are familiar with Edgar Allan Poe. Well, Faulkner's response was, I can write a Poe story better than Poe can write a Poe story. And that's how we ended up with A Rose for Emily. So I'm about to read this aloud to you guys. You need to follow along. If there are any typos in the story, just... Make it through. We're going to do the best we can do. Here we go. A Rose for Emily by William Faulkner. Section one. When Miss Emily Grierson died, our whole town went to her funeral. The men threw sort of a respectful affection for a fallen monument. The women, mostly out of curiosity, to see the inside of her house, which no one, save an old man's servant, a combined gardener and cook, had seen in at least 10 years. It was a big, squarish frame house that had once been white, decorated with cupolas and spires and scrolled balconies in the heavily lightsome style of the 70s, set on what had once been our most select street. But garages and cotton gins had encroached and obliterated even the august names of that neighborhood. Only Miss Emily's house was left, lifting its stubborn and coquettish decay above the cotton wagons and the gasoline pumps an eyesore among eyesores. And now, Miss Emily had gone to join the representatives of those august names where they lay in the Cedar Bemuse Cemetery among the ranked and anonymous graves of Union and Confederate soldiers who fell at the Battle of Jefferson. Alive, Miss Emily had been a tradition, a duty, and a care, a sort of hereditary obligation upon the town, dating from that day in 1894 when Colonel Sartoris, the mayor, remitted her taxes the dispensation dating from the death of her father on into perpetuity. Not that Miss Emily would have accepted charity. Colonel Sartoris invented an involved tale to the effect that Miss Emily's father had loaned money to the town, which the town, as a matter of business, preferred this way of repaying. Only a man of Colonel Sartoris's generation and thought could have invented it, and only a woman could have believed it. Now let's look back at this. It says in, in paragraph three, first sentence, Miss Emily had been a tradition, a duty, and a care, a sort of hereditary obligation upon the town. A hereditary obligation <clears throat> means like, it's not really like your total responsibility. You don't have to take care of someone. You don't have to do something. But it's the right thing to do. So the people in the town, they kind of look out for Miss Emily, you know, and in this case, she obviously was having trouble paying her taxes. So Colonel Sartoris, who was the mayor of the town, made up this story about her dad loaned the money some town to loan some money to the town. We never paid you back. So just don't worry about your taxes. It's gonna all even out. We're gonna be cool. And she was like, Oh, that sounds good. That's not good either. Sorry. 
I look so tall. Now, fourth paragraph. The next generation, with its more modern ideas, became mayors and aldermen. This arrangement created some little dissatisfaction. On the first of the year, they mailed her a tax notice. February came, and there was no reply. They wrote her a formal letter, asking her to call at the sheriff's office at her convenience. A week later, the mayor wrote her himself, offering to call or to send his car for her, and received in reply a note on paper of an archaic shape and a thin flowing calligraphy in faded ink, to the effect that she no longer went out at all. The tax notice was enclosed without comment. They called a special meeting of the Board of Aldermen. A deputation waited upon her, knocked at the door through which no visitor had passed since she ceased giving China painting lessons eight or ten years earlier. They were admitted by the old servant into a dim hall from which a stairway mounted into still more shadow. It smelled of dust and disuse, a close, dank smell. The servant led them into the parlor. It was furnished in heavy leather-covered furniture. When the servant opened the blinds of one window, they could see that the leather was cracked. And when they sat down, a faint dust rose sluggishly about their thighs, spinning with slow motes into the single sun ray on a tarnished gilt easel before the fireplace stood a crayon portrait of Miss Emily's father. So I want you to understand like how old everything in this house. Seems like the furniture hasn't been replaced in forever. You know, like the leather seats are cracking, there's dust everywhere. And then behind them or on the, on the wall is a, a picture of Miss Emily's dad. Kind of like he's still keeping a watch on everything. They rose when she entered, a small fat woman in black with a thin gold chain descending to her waist and vanishing into her belt, leaning on an ebony cane with a tarnished gold head. Her skeleton was small and spare. Perhaps that was why what would have been merely plumpness in another was obesity in her. She looked bloated, like a body long submerged in motionless water, and of that pallid hue. Her eyes, lost in the fatty ridges of her face, looked like two small pieces of coal pressed into a lump of dough as they moved from one face to another while the visitors stated their errand. So, after the, the old townspeople died, the old mayor, Colonel Sartoris, and the previous you know, city council, new people took over. And they're there because they noticed Miss Emily has not paid her taxes. So they're going to go try and be nice, like, hey, Miss Emily, you got to start paying your taxes. So that's why they're there. Bottom paragraph, page one. She did not ask them to sit. She just stood in the door and listened quietly until the spokesman came to a stumbling halt. Then they could hear the invisible watch ticking at the end of the gold chain. Her voice was dry and cold. I have no taxes in Jefferson. Colonel Sartoris explained it to me. Perhaps one of you can gain access to the city records and satisfy yourselves. But we have. We are the city authorities, Miss Emily. Didn't you get a notice from the sheriff signed by him? I received a paper. Yes, Miss Emily said. Perhaps he considers himself the sheriff. I have no taxes in Jefferson. But there is nothing on the books to show that you see, we must go by the C. Colonel Sartoris. I have no taxes in Jefferson. But Miss Emily, C. Colonel Sartoris. Colonel Sartoris had been dead almost 10 years. I have no taxes in Jefferson. Toby, the servant appeared, showed these gentlemen out. So she's not even aware that the previous mayor is not even there anymore. She is basically separated from reality. Section two. So she vanquished them, horse and foot, just like she had vanquished their fathers 30 years before about the smell. Now, right now, you should be asking yourself a question. What's the question? The question is, what smell? That was two years after her father's death and a short time after her sweetheart the one we believe would marry her, had deserted her. After her father's death, she went out very little. After her sweetheart went away, people hardly saw her at all. A few of the ladies had the temerity to call, but were not received. And the only sign of life about the place was the servant, a young man then, going in and out with a market basket. Just as if a man, any man, could keep a kitchen properly, the ladies said. So they were not surprised when the smell developed. It was another link 
between the gross teeming world and the high and mighty Grierson's. A neighbor, a woman, complained to the mayor, Judge Stevens, 80 years old. But what will you have me do about it, madam? He said. Why, send her word to stop it, the woman said. Is there a law? I'm sure that won't be necessary, Judge Stevens said. It's probably just a snake or a rat that servant of hers killed in the yard. I'll speak to him about it. The next day, he received two more complaints, one from a man who came in definite deprecation. We really must do something about it, Judge. I'd be the last one in the world to bother Miss Emily, but we've got to do something. That night, the board of aldermen met, three gray beards and one younger man, a member of the rising generation. It's simple enough, he said. Send her word to have her place cleaned up, give her a certain time to do it in, and if she don't, come on, sir, Judge Stevens said. Will you accuse a lady to her face of smelling bad? So this smell, you know, it is, it is permeating the entire neighborhood, this horrible smell coming from her house. So bad that, that people in the town are going to City Hall and complaining like, man, you got to tell Miss Emily to clean her place up. It stinks, make the whole neighborhood stink. We can't stand to go outside. And, and the, the mayor's like, man, I don't want to tell this old lady that her house stinks, you know? I'm trying to be polite here. We can just, can we just tolerate it for a couple days, maybe a week? And, and finally they're like, we just can't tolerate it. So the next night, uh, after midnight, four men crossed Miss Emily's lawn and slunk about the house like burglars. Sniffing along the base of the brickwork, and at the cellar openings, while one of them performed a regular sewing motion with his hand out of a sack slung from his shoulder. They broke open the cellar and sprinkled lime there and in the outbuildings. As they recrossed the lawn, the window that had been dark was lighted, and Miss Emily sat in it, the light behind her, and her upright torso motionless as that of an idol. They crept quietly across the lawn and into the shadow of the locusts that lined the street. After a week or two, the smell went away. So, I don't know if you guys um, are familiar with what, what lime is, but it would be like, um, like, like baking soda. So, I don't know if y'all are aware of this, but if you have a bad smell in your refrigerator, you can get a little thing of baking soda and just place it in your refrigerator and the smell is absorbed. I don't know how it does it. It's miraculous, but it completely goes away. So they essentially went and they spread lime with, around her yard, the edges of her yard, um, which would have the effect of, of baking soda to, to soak up whatever nasty smell is, is coming from, from her house. That was when people had begun to feel sorry for her. People in our town, remembering how old lady Wyatt, her great aunt had been completely crazy at, had gone completely crazy at last, believed that the Griersons held themselves a little too high for what they really were. None of the young men were quite good enough for Miss Emily and such. We had long thought of them as a tableau. Miss Emily, a slender figure in white in the background, her father, a spraddled silhouette in the foreground, his back to her and clutching a horse whip. The two of them framed by the back flung front door. So when she got to be 30 and was still single, we were not pleased exactly, but vindicated. Even with insanity in the family, she wouldn't have turned down all her chances if there had really been, if they had really materialized. So now we've got this thing that, that insanity runs in Miss Emily's family. Keep that in mind. When her father died, it got about that the house was all that was left to her. And in a way, people were glad. At last, they could pity Miss Emily. Being left alone and a pauper, she had become humanized. Now she too would know the old thrill and the old despair of a penny more or less. The day after his death, all the ladies prepared to call at the house and offer condolence and aid, as is our custom. Miss Emily met them at the door, dressed as usual and with no trace of grief on her face. She told them that her father was not dead. She did that for three days with the ministers calling on her and the doctors trying to persuade her to let them dispose of the body. Just as they were about to resort to law and force, she broke down and they buried her father quickly. We did not say she was crazy then. We believed she had to do that. We remembered all the young men her father had driven away and we knew that with nothing left, she would have to cling to that which had robbed her as people will. 
So even though she perhaps had chances to be married previously, her dad kind of, nobody was ever good enough, so he would run the guys off. Section three. She was sick for a long time. When we saw her again, her hair was cut short, making her look like a girl with a vague resemblance to those angels in colored church windows, sort of tragic and serene. The town had just left the contracts for paving the sidewalks, and in the summer after her father's death, they began to work. The construction company came with workers and mules and machinery, and a foreman named Homer Barron, a Yankee, a big, dark, ready man with a big voice and eyes lighter than his face. Pretty soon, he knew everybody in town. Whenever you heard a lot of laughing anywhere about the square, Homer Barron would be in the center of the group. Presently, we began to see him and Miss Emily on Sunday afternoons, driving in the yellow-wheeled buggy and the match team of hay of bays from the livery stable. So, so the town is, is really beginning to develop, and they're having to put in sidewalks. Now, nowadays, we have sidewalks everywhere, but they weren't always there. So there were companies that would go around. They'd get, they'd get hired by, by a town. You know, a city council would hire them. They'd come in. They'd, they'd put sidewalks in, however many streets you wanted to have sidewalks. Say it would take them six months, maybe a year. And then after they finished, they would move on to the next town that needed sidewalks. And after that, they'd move to the next town. So the foreman, that means the man in charge, He's not the owner, but he's the one that kind of runs the crew. He and Miss Emily met and have become acquainted, and they've kind of started seeing each other. Now, he's a Yankee, which means he's, he's from up north. Miss Emily's a southern lady, and this is kind of really, you weren't supposed to date a Yankee if you were a southern lady, especially an old-school southern lady like Miss Emily was that had roots in this southern town. Section 3, second paragraph, by the way. Excuse me, third paragraph. At first, we were glad that Miss Emily would have an interest because the ladies all said, of course, a Grierson would not think seriously of a northerner, a day laborer. But there were still others, older people, who said that even grief could not cause a real lady to forget noblesse oblige without calling noblesse oblige. That means she has like this noble obligation of there are only certain people she's allowed to date or consider for marriage. They just said, poor Emily, her kinsfolk should come to her. She had some kin in Alabama, but years ago, her father had fallen out with them over the, the estate of old Lady Wyatt, the crazy woman, and there was no communication between the two families. They had not even been represented at the funeral. And as soon as the old people said, poor Emily, the whispering began. Do you suppose it's really so? They said to one another. Of course it is. What else could... This behind their hands, rustling of crane silk and satin behind jalousies closed upon the sun of Sunday afternoon as the thin, swift clop, clop, clop of the match team passed. Poor Emily. So it's talking about people seeing her go on her Sunday ride. You know, obviously they were being pulled behind a wagon back then. She carried her head high enough, even when we believed that she was fallen. It was as if she demanded more than ever the recognition of her dignity as the last Grierson, as if it had wanted that touch of earthiness to reaffirm her imperviousness, like when she bought the rat poison, the arsenic. That was over a year after they had begun to say poor Emily, and while the two female cousins were visiting her. I want some poison, she said to the druggist. She was over 30 then, still a slight woman, though thinner than usual, with cold, haughty black eyes and a face of flesh of which was strained across the temples and about the eye sockets as you imagine a lighthouse keeper's face ought to look. I want some poison, she said. Yes, Miss Emily, what kind? For rats and such, I'd recommend... I want the best you have. I don't care what kind. The druggist named several. They'll kill anything up to an elephant. But what you want is arsenic, Miss Emily said. Is that a good one? Is... Arsenic? Yes, ma'am. But what you want, I want arsenic. The druggist looked down at her. She looked back at him. Erect, her face like a strained flag. Why, of course, the druggist said, if that's what you want, but the law requires you to tell me what you are going to use it for. Miss Emily just stared at him. Her head tilted back in order to look him eye for eye until he looked away and went and got the arsenic and wrapped it up. The delivery boy brought her the package. The druggist didn't come back. When she opened the package at home, there was written on the box, under the skull and bones, for rats. Section four. The next day we all said, she will kill herself. And we said it would be the best thing. 
When she had first begun to be seen with Homer Barron, we had said, she will marry him. Then we said, she will persuade him yet, because Homer himself remarked that he was not a marrying man. Later we said, poor Emily, behind the jalousies as they passed on Sunday afternoon in the glittering buggy. Miss Emily with her head high and Homer Barron with his hat cocked and a cigar in his teeth, reins and a whip and a yellow glove. So Homer, he's a nice guy and he seems to like Miss Emily, but he's just, when he says he's not a married man, he's marrying man, he just doesn't want to get married. He kind of likes being free and going from place to place, just doing his work and mind his own business. Just a second, I'll be right back. Okay, thank you. Then some of the ladies began to say that it was a disgrace to the town and a bad example of the young people. The men did not want to interfere, but at last the ladies forced the Baptist minister, Miss Emily's people were Episcopal, to call upon her. He would never divulge what happened during that interview, but he refused to go back again. The next Sunday, they again drove about the streets, and the following day, the minister's wife wrote to Miss Emily's relations in Alabama. So, she had blunt kin under her roof again, and we sat back to watch developments. At first, nothing happened. Then we were sure that they were to be married. We learned that Miss Emily had been to the jewelers and had ordered a men's toilet set in silver with the letters HB on each piece. Two days later, we learned that she had bought a complete outfit of men's clothing, including a nightshirt, and we said, they're married. We were really glad. We were glad because the two female cousins were even more grierous than Miss Emily had ever been. And when it says that Miss Emily went and bought a toilet set, it doesn't mean like something for your toilet. It means like a shaving kit or perhaps a mirror or a hairbrush and, and she, or a comb, and she had his initials engraved on it, HB. So we were not surprised when Homer Barron, the streets had been finished for some time since, was gone. We were a little disappointed that there was not a public blowing off, but we believed that he had gone on to prepare for Miss Emily's coming or to give her a chance to get rid of the cousins. By that time, it was a cabal, and we were all Miss Emily's allies to help circumvent the cousins. Sure enough, after, after another week, they departed, and as we had expected all along, within three days, Homer Barron was back in town. A neighbor saw the servant admit him at the kitchen door at dusk one evening, and that was the last we saw of Homer Barron and of Miss Emily for some time. The servant went in and out with the market basket, but the front door remained closed. Now and then we would see her at a window for a moment, as the men did that night when they sprinkled the line. But for almost six months, she did not appear on the streets. Then we knew that this was to be expected too, as if the quality of her father, which had thwarted her woman's life so many times, had been too violent and too furious to die. When we next saw Miss Emily, she had grown fat and her hair was turning gray. During the next few weeks, it grew grayer and grayer until it attained an even pepper and salt iron gray. When it ceased turning, up to the day of her death at 74, it was still that vigorous iron gray, like the hair of an active man. From that time on, her front door remained closed, save for a period of six or seven years when she was about 40, during which she gave lessons in China painting. She fitted up a studio in one of the downstairs rooms where the daughters and granddaughters of Colonel Sartoris' contemporaries were sent to her in the same regularity and in the same spirit that they were sent to church on Sundays with a 25-cent piece for the collection plate. Meanwhile, her taxes had been remitted. Then the newer generation became the backbone and the spirit of the town, and the painting pupils grew up and fell away and did not send their children to her with boxes of color and tedious brushes and pictures cut from the ladies' magazines. The front door closed upon the last one and remained closed for good. When the town got free postal delivery, Miss Emily alone refused to let them fasten the metal numbers above her door and attach a mailbox to it. She would not listen to them. Daily, monthly, yearly, we watched the servant grow grayer and more stooped, going in and out with the market basket. Each day we sent her a tax notice, excuse me, each December, we sent her a tax notice which, she, which will be returned by the post office a week later unclaimed. Now and then we would see her in one of the downstairs windows. She had evidently shut up the top floor of the house like the carven torso of an idol in a niche, looking or not looking at us, we could never tell which. Then she passed from generation to generation, dear, inescapable, impervious, tranquil, and perverse. And so she died. Fell ill in the house filled with dust and shadows with only a doddering servant to wait on her. We did not even know she was sick. We had long since given up trying to get any information from the servant. He talked to no one, probably not even to her, for his voice had grown harsh and rusty as if from disuse. 
She died in one of the downstairs rooms in a heavy walnut bed with a curtain. Her gray head propped on a pillow, yellow and moldy with age and lack of sunlight. Section five. The servant met the first of the ladies at the front door and let them in with their hushed, sibilant voices and their quick, curious glances, and then he disappeared. He walked right through the house and out the back and was not seen again. The two female cousins came at once. They held the funeral on the second day with the town coming to look at Miss Emily beneath a mass of bought flowers. With the crayon face of her father musing profoundly above the beer, the buyer and the ladies sibilant and macabre, and the very old men, some in their brushed Confederate uniforms, on the porch and the lawn talking with Miss Emily as if they had been a contemporary of theirs. She had been a contemporary of theirs, believing that they had danced with her and maybe even courted her, perhaps. Confusing time with its mathematical progression as the old do, to whom all the past is not a diminishing road, but instead a huge meadow, which no winter ever quite touches, divided then, divided from them now by the narrow bottleneck of the most recent decade of years. Already we knew that there was one room in that region above stairs, which no one had seen in 40 years and which would have to be forced. They waited until Miss Emily was decently in the ground before they opened it. The violence of breaking down the door seemed to fill this room with pervading dust. A thin, acrid pall as of the tomb seemed to lie everywhere upon this room, decked and furnished as for a bridal. Upon the valance curtains of faded rose color, upon the rose-shaded lights, upon the dressing table, upon the delicate array of crystal and the man's toilet things backed with tarnished silver, silver so tarnished that the monogram was obscured. Among them lay a collar and tie, as if they had just been removed, which lifted, left upon the surface a pale crescent in the dust. Upon a chair hung the suit, carefully folded, folded beneath it, the two mute shoes and the discarded socks. The man himself lay in the bed. For a long while, we just stood there, looking down at the profound and fleshless grin. The man had apparently once lain in the attitude of an embrace, but now the long sleep that outlasts love, that conquers even the grimace of love, had cuckolded him. What was left of him rotted beneath what was left of the nightshirt, had become inextricable from the bed in which he lay, and upon him and upon the pillow beside him lay that even coating of the patient and biting dust. Then we noticed that in the second pillow was the indentation of a head. One of us lifted something from it, and leaning forward, that faint and invisible dust, dry and acrid in the nostrils, we saw a long strand of iron gray hair.